Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Teen Science Cafe. My name is Takiwa Smith. I am founder and executive director of Science Engineering and Mathematics, Lincoln Incorporated. The Teen Science Cafe is a program of our Math and Science Career Academy, whose goal is to introduce teens to STEM professionals so they can learn about STEM careers during a critical time of their educational experience, their middle and high school years, when they're making decisions about what they're going to do in high school and what they're going to do in college. And so we are excited to bring you the diversity of STEM professionals so that you can learn about STEM careers as well as have the STEM professionals share their journey with you on how they become the STEM professional that they are and they, how they explored interest in their field. So I am going to turn it over to our program coordinator, Carlin Pounder, who is going to introduce our speaker for the evening. All right, so. Um, academic aiming to improve STEM through research and practice. Lauren earned her PhD in engineering education from Virginia Tech. She also um, graduated from Spelman College with a bachelor's in physics, and she also has a master's. More recently, her research interests lie in the intersection, intersections of womanism, social justice, and STEM products, processes, and knowledge. Lauren's professional roles have all been related to launching and growing large-scale STEM education programs, which makes her a perfect fit for speaking with us today to talk to us about a topic like artificial intelligence. She is currently the artificial intelligence AI skills advisory practice leader at IBM and an affiliate assistant professor at the University of Washington in human-centered design and engineering. So without further ado, I will hand it over to Dr. Quigley and she'll tell you more about um, her STEM story and her STEM journey. Hi everyone, good to meet you. Thank you both for having me and for the introduction. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen so we can get started here. Um, let's see. Sure this plays. All right. So um, again, my name is Lauren Thomas Quigley. I am a um, curriculum lead at IBM, and I'm really happy to be here tonight to talk to you all about making AI work. So designing um, artificial intelligence solutions, and the goal today is really just to um, introduce you guys um, to artificial intelligence, machine learning, and data science some of the principles for social good and social justice that can be incorporated into data science and AI, a little bit about careers, and then some resources available to you for career development. So tonight you'll learn a couple things. So one, becoming familiar with fundamentals of AI, machine learning, and data science. Understand the broad career pathways that are available and again some of the access to some of the resources that we have available at IBM and other places that you can learn more about AI and then again some of those fundamental um, ideas around social justice when it comes to artificial intelligence. So a little bit about me. Um, I'm originally from New Jersey. Um, I went to Spelman College for undergrad. I was a physics major there. That's how I met Ms. Smith back in the day. And um, from there, I wasn't sure exactly what I wanted to do. I, went, I knew I was interested in um, education. I was doing an educational research project um, as an undergraduate student and really enjoyed it, but I didn't want to be a teacher. So I wasn't totally sure what I wanted to do. And um, Went on to graduate school at Norfolk State University in optical engineering, and that was a really great opportunity for me to really dig into more educational research and specifically engineering education. And um, from there, I decided to go on to get my PhD because I really, really enjoyed the research and the opportunity to share with others and learn about how people learn um, science and engineering. 
So I went to Virginia Tech. Um, I was the first black woman to graduate from their PhD program in 2013. And um, from there, I've really developed my career in large scale STEM education, um, in higher ed, in nonprofits, and in industry. And um, so I'm I'm an affiliate faculty at University of Washington as well. Um, and that gives me opportunity to continue doing research work. And I work full time at IBM as a curriculum developer. And this is a really cool opportunity because my job is basically helping people um, and companies learn about artificial intelligence and building their capacity when it comes to implementing data science and AI. So um, when people ask what my STEM is, my STEM is education, literacy for all, AI, data science, and machine learning, uh, womanism and social justice, and, and I have degrees in physics, optical engineering, and engineering education. But really my favorite kind of STEM role that I have is fairy godmother, that's what I call it. And um, that's the opportunity that I have to work with and mentor students and help connect them to resources and opportunities and things that they want to do in their future lives. And I currently live in Texas. So it's a little bit about me. Um, what do I do? So no one really knows what an AI curriculum lead is. I didn't know when I started my job. So no, don't ever hesitate to take a job in, when you're not totally sure what's involved. Um, but really most of my days involve a lot of meetings and developing presentations and problem solving, but really it's focused around four main things. So applying the knowledge of how people learn and, and helping them learn about artificial intelligence, learning more about the current technologies and artificial intelligence and the capabilities, what are the things that we actually can do and implement, um, developing program strategies um, for organizations that wanna learn more about AI, and then, of course, um, sometimes, but not very often, I get to do a little bit of artificial intelligence work myself, which is fun. So um, in the chat, and I don't know, um, Takiwa and Carolyn, if you can tell me, because I can't see the chat, but what kinds of AI are you all familiar with? And um, what do you think are some ways that AI can help solve problems? How, how can people use AI to solve problems? So I want to get an idea of what you all know before we um, you know, get too far in. What do you think? Any comments in the chat? Not yet, but okay. we've been having issues with the chat. So okay. let's see if it works. Maybe they'll well, come later. Okay, well, no worries. We'll get we'll keep going. Um, you know, there's lots of I'm going to talk a little bit more about artificial intelligence. And I'm sure that as we go through, folks will start to realize some of the cool ways that we're using AI all the time. So um, I want to get started. There are three kinds of intelligence. And when we think about intelligence, a lot of times we're thinking about human intelligence. And, you know, that's our our way of being able to learn, uh, reach conclusions, make decisions, and explain our decisions. So that's something that is definitely, you know, human intelligence separates us from the animals, and it is about our ability to learn new material, whether it's something school-related or something not. Being able to make decisions and rationalizing is a huge part of human intelligence. So. To kind of start thinking about what artificial intelligence is, it's really important to kind of identify what human intelligence really is. And then we can add into that artificial intelligence, and that's a computer's ability to learn from data, make some conclusions, and um, explain those decisions. So we might not always think about artificial intelligence in this way, but it's really important to remember that um, artificial intelligence is about learning from data and information. As humans, we learn from the outside world that we interact with through our senses, through um, reading and learning other material, but computers learn from the data that we provide them. So that's an important component to keep in mind. And then also artificial intelligence is about using that data to reach conclusions and make some decisions and importantly, being able to explain those decisions. It's a really critical part. So hang on to that nugget. 
We also want to introduce this idea of augmented intelligence. And augmented intelligence is the combination of human and machine intelligence together. So there are a lot of times where there are limitations on our human ability to reason and make decisions and explain them, and sometimes quickly with a lot of data. You know, all of our lives, you know, especially now, we're getting inundated with lots of information, and you might not always remember everything, right? You might not always be able to quickly make a decision in the split second. However, we can partner with machines to be able to add some resources and decision making that can be faster or more efficient than our ability, and sometimes even more rational than our ability to make decisions. So, augmented intelligence is really about bringing together humans and machines and allowing humans to add and create interpersonal value. So this is these are the things that, as human beings, we're way better at doing than machines. People are better at art. People are better at understanding each other and emotions and a lot of other um, experiences that are not data, not necessarily entirely data driven. And we also um, we can allow the machines to be able to predict and respond to a large amount of data very quickly. So when we think about all of these pieces of intelligence, I want to like dig in obviously some more around artificial intelligence. And artificial intelligence is really about having a program that can sense, reason, act, and adapt. So if we think about um, the large field of artificial intelligence, I'm going to give you guys a few diagrams here. But it's really important to think about artificial intelligence as any sort of machine that can sense, reason, act, and adapt, right? And there's different ways that we might think about artificial intelligence when it comes to technologies and specific algorithms and the kinds of tasks that AI can do. So that's where we start to think about artificial intelligence as visual recognition, as natural language processing and voice recognition or robotics. So these are just some examples of the kinds of things that machines can do that emulate um, human intelligence. But let's like make this really practical. So what are some examples? So this first picture is a classic artificial intelligence picture. And it is a series of small images of either bagels or dogs. So as human beings, we can look at this series of pictures and be able to discern, oh, the first one in the upper corner is a dog because we can see the ears and the tail. But it's not all that different when you zoom out and maybe, um, you know, and look at some of the details to the picture immediately next to it, where that's definitely a bagel. And as you look through some of through these images, as a, machines can sometimes have a hard time telling the difference between these tasks, but we can train a model which I'll explain a little bit more, to be able to discern the difference between a dog and a bagel. So even when we're thinking about um, AI tasks, that's a very classic example. Another one that you all are probably familiar with is um, the facial recognition. If you have a, an iPhone or certain um, Androids, you have a facial recognition feature on your phone that will unlock your phone just when you hold up the screen to your face. It recognizes your face because you've trained the model on data and images of your face. So like when you're setting up your phone, it might ask you to go in different light and turn the phone in different angles, all of those different features so that you can unlock your phone and be able to interact with it without entering your password or, or using a thumbprint. So that's an, an example of artificial intelligence. Another one is interacting with our smart assistants that we might have in our homes. So it's Siri on our phone, it is Google Home, it is Alexa, there's um, Cortana, lots of different um, virtual assistants that we might interact with every day in our homes or at school or at work, um, at least back when we could go places. But when you think about examples of AI tasks, these are all things that the human senses would be able to discern, but we've created machines to be able to make the, to discern to discern, I'm sorry, the difference between, um, you know, maybe you and your sibling when you're unlocking your phone or a dog and a bagel when you're looking at a series of images or Alexa recognizing that you're talking to Alexa versus OK Google. So that's like the big picture, but let's drill down a little bit more. Machine learning is a 
component of artificial intelligence. And machine learning really focuses on algorithms that perform, um, that improve their performance as they're exposed to more data over time. So you could think about this just like you think about your school learning experience. As a student, you might be, you'll become better at different, um, let's say uh, if you're if you're a math student you'll become better at applying different mathematical methods as you learn more material over time you're exposed to more data and you improve your skills over time machine learning works the exact same way and it's really about developing an algorithm that as you feed it with more data whether that data comes from you know um, let's say it could be the stock market it could be weather data there's lots of different places where you can get data where the algorithm can improve its performance and particularly its ability to predict or repeat an action um, over time. So when we think about machine learning, um, it's really about machines that learn by experience and acquire skills without human involvement. So when we're thinking about that, you'll hear words around supervised learning, unsupervised learning, and reinforcement learning. So I'll give you a couple of machine learning examples that we're all pretty familiar with. If you're on social media, you um, definitely are having an experience that's driven by machine learning, whether it's YouTube pointing you to and recommending the next video, whether it is Facebook connecting you to a friend of a friend or suggesting a certain ad or a Pinterest where you're looking at different pictures, Instagram, when you look at your, um, your explore options to determine and look for other videos or other content you might be interested in, it's all driven on machine learning. The more you interact with these platforms, the more data that you provide them so that they can perform better for your curated learning experience or your curated entertainment experience. Also, we've all been on lockdown or you know social distancing, so we've probably been watching a lot of Netflix or Hulu. Netflix and Hulu provide us recommendations about things we might want to watch based on how we rated other shows, the shows that we've watched to completion, the shows that maybe we only watched half an episode and we stopped, or the movies that we really enjoy. But that's an example of machine learning. Another is uh, reinforcement learning. And I'm going to show you this because I think it's a pretty cool example of what machine learning and, and um, reinforcement learning can really do. So I'm going to have to switch over, but I'm going to show you this um, video rather quickly. And what you're seeing is a um, reinforcement learning robot. So this is a robot that is flipping a pancake. So we might be able to flip a pancake at home in our skillet like is being demonstrated right now. So what's happening is this scientist is teaching the robot arm how to flip a pancake. And the first time it's not so great at it. It's gonna try a few more times, you know, and it takes, some, it takes a bit of time. So you might not be able to immediately, you know, go if you've ever flipped a pancake in the skillet in your house, you might not be great at it the first time, just like this robot arm is not. But you can see the skill developing over time. Other examples are, you know, like I played basketball in high school. We had to shoot free throws forever. And this is exactly why, because as you're training that, you know, the muscle in being able to flip you know, to shoot a free throw, you can also train a robot to be able to flip a pancake. And what we're doing in this example, this motion capture system is providing additional data for the robot to be able to understand where the pancake is moving. So now the, the robot arm is able to actually flip the pancake pretty successfully, but it takes 50 trials. So one of the things that's um, interesting and something to think about um, when we're talking about artificial intelligence and machine learning and the like is that you have to practice and train just like we would as students, as learners in our day-to-day -day lives. We have to practice and train to be able to um, complete certain tasks. 
And then finally, we have deep learning. Deep learning is a really small subset of artificial intelligence and machine learning. And this is where essentially we're designing algorithms that behave more like the human brain, that can take data in from lots of different resources and places to be able to make decisions and, um, and be able to make assessments of what's happening in the world around. And there's a couple really good examples. So just like, you know, we might be able to play along with a game like Jeopardy. This is an example where IBM's Watson um, played against two Jeopardy champions. And it's not so much about recall, but it, you know, if you think about those kinds of questions in from Jeopardy, the, the way that the um, answers are phrased, it's not just exactly a one-to-one -one match. You have to be able to correlate lots of different data points to be able to answer those questions well. So it's not just like a Google search. And essentially, the, you know, the example here is like Watson has been created to behave like our brains where we can, you know, reason and infer information to be able to um, and collect data from lots of different sources. So that's an example of deep learning. Another example of deep learning that we hear a lot about is autonomous vehicles. So yes, there are autonomous vehicles. And the reason why they work is that they're collecting data from lots of different directions. So you can see in this image, these cars are collecting data from not just their own, the, what's happening in their, that vehicle, but the vehicles around them so that you don't crash essentially. And that's one of the ideas around deep learning because when we drive a car, we're using lots of different senses and knowledge and behaviors to be able to safely navigate and, and operate our vehicles. The same would apply in an autonomous vehicle. Another example is this um, example of a dog with a hat. So if you search, if you image search maybe for a dog, you might not get a picture of a dog with a hat and a hat with a wide brim. But as humans, we can decipher the elements of this picture to know that there's a dog. There's a dog with a hat with a wide brim and it's a yellow hat with a wide brim. And being able to, to um, decipher the components of that image is an example of deep learning where the algorithm can actually go ahead and separate what we see in a complex picture that may not logically work together um, in a very, um, in a linear fashion like typical programming. All right, so what about data science? I talked to you guys about data science in the beginning and data science is really about um, applied statistical knowledge with large amounts of data applied to algorithms in context of a specific domain to understand phenomena explained by the data, right? It's a whole bunch of words. But when we hear things like big data and data science and machine learning and artificial intelligence, data and data science is really truly the core and data science is the core of all of these areas because we need to have some sort of information for our models to be able to train or learn learn from to be able to make decisions so for all of my math and statistics fans you can become a data science scientist by developing skills also in machine learning and then also what we're calling subject matter expertise um, and this I really like this diagram because it shows you the importance and the essential kind of features around data science. We think about data science and maybe we think about artificial intelligence. Let's talk about artificial intelligence. A lot of times we hear about these dangerous um, algorithms and software that are going to do bad things to us, right? The reason why that happens, and if you look at this image, it's a the only overlap there is that there's some subject matter expertise around the space that the algorithm is being applied, and lots of data and computer science. And in that danger zone is when we don't think about what is the um, reliability, what is the, um, the significance and the power of the data, and what is the data actually telling us about um, whatever that subject might be and the algorithm performance itself. Data science and machine learning are really tightly coupled because within you have to have some level of data science to be able to do machine learning work and that relies again on the math and statistics skills and then also when we think about maybe traditional research so for all of our scientists or social scientists 
there's a you have lots of examples where you're going to do lots of different statistical modeling, whether it's regressions or ANOVAs or t-tests to be able to understand your data, whether you're, you know, an agriculture person and you're growing seeds or you're growing animals, or if you're testing certain chemicals, you're going to do some sort of math and statistics to be able to understand the performance of your um, experiment. But when you bring in data science with that traditional research, you're able to um, also use that for prediction as well as testing before you experiment, which is really cool. When we think about data science, there are some languages and software that we use. We use Python and R and SQL. And it's definitely one thing I want you guys to take away is that data science and truly machine learning and artificial intelligence are really interdisciplinary by nature. So we draw knowledge from lots of different places. It's not just math and statistics, but it's computer science. It's from our domain areas. It's from lots of different areas. So something that's always super important is understanding the role of data. So data is really important as we think about how we apply data science in an artificial intelligence and machine learning. And this image is actually just a representation of a really classic um, phrase that you might hear in artificial intelligence and machine learning, which is garbage in and garbage out. So the idea that if you throw junk data into your um, algorithm, even if you have the best algorithm in the world, you're still going to get junk out. And the only the quality of the data science and AI work that you can do is entirely based on the value of the data that you put in. So let's think about an example. Let's say um, you have an, a personal assistant at home, whether it's Google, Alexa, whatever. And instead of, let's say that your, um, your device is set to English as the primary language. Well, that device is not gonna respond to, let's say Spanish or German or any other language because it's, it doesn't recognize that data. So even though the machine is designed to be able to respond and give you, you know, play music or unlock the doors or whatever you have it um, set up to do. If you're not providing the right kind of data to that algorithm, it won't be able to process it. And that's one example. Another example, which is um, a really classic one when we talk about artificial intelligence, is um, like image searching and image matching. So there's like been lots of controversy around things like Google image search and other products where they might not be able to match pictures of, you know, of certain groups of people because the models haven't been trained to do that. And it really is about having the data to go into the system to be able to train that. So an, again, an example could be if you have an image of a white car and you have and you want to be able to match images of white cars you can't you can't train your model on a bunch of images of red cars the algorithm will not recognize that white car and won't be able to match it so you know i kind of talk about some of the bad ways that data is you know can sometimes be misused or um, influences the quality of data science and AI. But there is a really important life cycle that we can leverage when we think about how data science works. And it really is about this entire process. So I'll start with um, exploratory data analysis. So this is where we go out in the world and understand what the data is. And then we start to create a model. And that model is really just a mathematical model. What is the distribution of the data? Or are we, um, are we doing a regression curve? Or are we classifying the data? And classification is, is simply sorting. Are we comparing red items and blue items? So we have a process where we collect the data from the world, and then we do some modeling to understand it. Then we start to apply, in, and depending on your domain space, um, our business understanding. How does this make sense? So what is what? importance does this have on the work that I do? So an example that we have potentially, you know, an example I have worked with before is, um, let's say we have a bunch of customers visiting a website. Well, we want to understand maybe what these customers are buying and the importance of that to 
to the business? Is it really important that we sell more electronics than pencils? And what does that look like? So we use that to that understanding and knowledge to develop a model and then we de we deploy that model into production. And in order to do that, we'll prepare the data, we will um, evaluate our model, and then we'll check to make sure it makes sense. Okay, so we predicted that you know these clients or these customers will always buy electronics and this segment of customers will buy pencils. Um, and we continue that process, which is really important. So I wanted to highlight to you here is that data never becomes absent in the process of implementing artificial intelligence and machine learning. All right, so I'm gonna do a quick poll um, and you guys can enter this into the chat. But what is, so we talked a bunch about AI. So what is an AI solution that you use regularly? Could be a smart assistant, entertainment, curated um, social media, your face ID, phone feature. What are some AI solutions that you use all the time? We have a couple ideas. Okay, I'm gonna assume you do. And we're gonna go ahead and talk about how do we actually use that um, information. So one at IBM, we have what we call IBM design thinking. And one of the principles that's really important to us is that people are at the center of everything we do and every problem that we solve. And we don't wanna just create solutions, especially tech solutions that don't make a difference for anyone. And in order to do that, we go through this design thinking process. And really the goal is to align between technology and users. And it's super easy to get excited about a certain kind of technology. Some people are really passionate about natural language. Some people are really passionate about visual recognition. And these are really cool spaces. But how do we make that useful for people is super important. And in order to do that, we go through an, a process where we identify some goals, we research users' wants and needs, we identify the data and create a model around that data, we identify how the technology, what the right technology solution might be, we um, connect the model with artificial intelligence, and then we test and we iterate a lot. So here's an example. Um, we've uh, developed a solution where we developed for a hotel chain an in-room agent assistant. And it's a conversational agent that will be able to do a few things. It helps the guest um, learn how to use some of the uh, features in their room, whether it's the temperature or know where the ice machine is or whatever it is. Um, control the room uh, temperature. So instead of them trying to fiddle with the thermostat to turn the temperature up or down, you can just say, talk to the assistant and be able to do, um, to change the temperature in the room. Um, also, you know, sometimes if you're in a hotel, you might want to have um, room service. And instead of calling through, you know, waiting to get someone to answer in the restaurant to, or to make your order, you can leave your your um, your order with the in-room virtual assistant, and then boom, someone brings you your food to your room. And then also something that could be um, really useful when we think about uh, these conversational agents is, you know, how can you make the st the stay better the next time? So a simple example is that I have really bad allergies. I always need a synthetic pillow, and instead of having to every time I make a reservation ask for that. Um, the agent, the assistant knows that when Lauren's making a reservation, she needs a synthetic pillow. So how we would solve this problem at IBM through design thinking is that we will work with um, some of the business managers to identify some goals that they really care about for improving the guest experience. Then we would work with design researchers to contact real guests, real people who stay at this hotel, and understand what they want, what they need in their in their stay, and whether they do that through interviews or um, surveys. There's lots of different ways to collect this kind of data to understand what users want in their in their experience. Once we've collected that data and made it into numeric data, 
data scientists can look at that and identify a model that predicts the needs based on, you know, whether it's guest profile or length of stay or whatever variable is the important one. And then we'll have AI engineers look at the data types and what we call APIs, which is essentially um, features that you can pull off the shelf to, um, to provide guests with the right solutions. So what I'd like for you all to do is think about creating an AI app for students to do well who are managing school, extracurricular work, and social life activities. So as students, your schedules are, are going to be busy, and it can change weekly. It might not be the same schedule every week. And if you think about an app, or there's an app on your phone or your computer, you might want to think about several capabilities to help students keep up with their lives. So there's a few kinds of questions that you might want to solve. You might want to do a goal tracker, so helping students um, you know, identify their goals for the week and monitor their prog progress. You may want to do something like schedule reminders. So I know that like I live by the reminders on my phone to tell me where to be or what meetings I have. And maybe that's something that's really important to have a process to schedule and to remind students of their schedule so that they can keep track of everything. Also, you might think about maybe having an advisor to help students prioritize their tasks, or maybe there's something else. So I'll give you all a minute and think about what is a problem that you might want to solve. And we're kind of gonna go through a little bit of a uh, mental walkthrough of what this solution might look like. Let's take a minute. What kind of problem do you wanna solve for a student, for a busy student? All right, so hopefully everyone has a problem that they wanna solve. So let's think about how artificial intelligence can help. What kind of AI capabilities does your app need to have? Does it need to be able to predict something? If so, what? Um, does it need to have automated reminders? Um, back when we were kind of moving about, I would always rely on my calendar to send me a reminder to say, leave in five minutes because traffic is, you know, whatever it is between where I am and my next destination. So that's like a kind of um, automated reminder that you might want to think about. Um, maybe you want a chat bot where the student can interact with a, um, with a chat bot to be able to answer some questions, maybe to help with their homework or something like that. Also like a homework helper. So I know a lot of times when I was a student, I would, you know, it's not just about the assignment that you have in front of you. It's like looking through your textbook or looking online to find how do I solve this problem? So maybe a homework helper is a feature that you might or a capability that you might want your app to have. Another um, feature that you could think about is like a social media blockout. I know, you know, sometimes like we really love Instagram, but Instagram can be really distracting because you go down the rabbit hole and then next thing you know, an hour has passed. So having maybe a social media blockout feature that, you know, uh, prevents you from going onto your social media apps until your homework assignment is submitted, whatever that might be. Or maybe a recommendation tool, maybe something that can connect you to internship opportunities or summer programs related to, um, the things that you're enjoying most about your schoolwork. So when we think about capabilities, these are some of the kinds of things that you could think about. And hopefully these are some ideas for you to think about how you might design your own solution or your own app for students. So the next thing is we wanna think about the kinds of data that we might need. So for a busy student, there are some things that are going to be really important as far as um, data when we think about um, an app that will support us. So maybe you need your class syllabi or the course web page. If you have a job, you want to get your work schedule that you might get from an email or text every week. Um, maybe something like I mentioned around traffic, if you're taking the bus, like public transportation, or if you're doing ride share like Lyft or Uber, how like what kind of data do you need uh, maybe when it comes to getting from one place to another? Um, you might want to think about data when it comes to your social media notifications. 
Sometimes students use their social media to work on class projects. Well, you want to be able to, you know, tell the difference between this is a class project conversation or this is, you know, a funny video from TikTok. And then also, um, you know, maybe we want to think about data that will help us rank and prioritize tasks. And there's lots of different places that these data points can come from. But ideally, with this example, you can start to think about the ways that, you know, you can look all over the world in the world that we live in, the world around us, and the things that we're interacting with to be able to identify data sources for an AI solution. And then a really important step, and this is where we start to think about some of the impacts of for people when it comes to artificial technology, uh, I'm sorry, artificial intelligence and machine learning technologies. So thinking about what are the positive and negative, negative ways that this solution can affect people. So I just jotted down some positives and some negatives. So some positives of an app like this would be like to help you get more things done. Um, you can ha enjoy more balanced time so that, you know, you can spread out your work so that you're not cramming, you know, every Sunday night or every Thursday night before a test. Also, maybe you want to have like a safety feature so that if something goes wrong. You can let someone know if you're, you know, missing or like, you know, if you're, you get a car, flat tire in your car, whatever it might be. Maybe there, that's a, a positive that people, you know, you can easily connect with others if something happens. And then really just like, you know, doing better in school. Those are really great positives to an app like this. But then maybe some negatives that we might want to think about are like maybe the data could be shared with the wrong person. Not everyone needs to know where you are all the time. So that could be a negative. Um, a negative could be that you miss important information. I know sometimes, you know, we find out like important things with family or friends from social media. But if you're blocked out, you, you might miss that information altogether. And that can be, you know, hurtful in some ways. And then also there's a chance that it could impact your relationships or friendships in a negative way. But an important part of the AI solutioning process is to really think through and identify all the positives and negatives and then do what we call mitigation and identifying the, the um, parameters by which we address or we choose not to address certain um, situations. And this is a really creative part of the process that um, gets us to really rely not just on the technical knowledge that we have, but our lived experience and then the research from social scientists and that sort of thing. So I gave you, you know, here are a couple other questions that you always want to think about when you're thinking about AI design and solution design. So what is a specific problem that you want to address? So you have to be really targeted in identifying what the important question is. What kind of capabilities do you want? How does this affect people? And what kinds of data do you need? These are core questions that anytime you want to design an AI solution, you should think through. Also, um, there's a really great resource, and it's almost like a workbook. And it's called um, A People's Guide to AI. And you can go to their website, the book, you can either get a virtual download or get a hard copy of it for like under $10. But it's basically a workbook to help you go through the process to design an AI solution that matters and is safe for people. All right, so we're almost done. Um, I want to talk a little bit about some technical roles um, related to artificial intelligence and data science and machine learning. They're all the same. Um, and there are some specific roles that you could really think about um, on the business side. Uh, business analytics. So this is like a what I would call tech adjacent sort of role where you're using some visual tools and you're doing some descriptive analytics and connecting the business problems to the um, to the data that that your business or your team is relying on. You have data engineers, and these are the folks that do some of the real hard work around managing data, preparing data, and they actually are coding some of the solutions to clean and prepare data, also to put it into production. And then we have data scientists who really bring all the pieces together across the domain knowledge, data science, and computer science to be able to design models, test them, and make sure that they fit the solution that we're working on. And then we have app developers. App developers are kind of in the 
in the middle, but more on the tech side, where they're actually pulling what we call off-the-shelf APIs to be able to develop solutions. So they might say, I want to grab this chatbot tool, I want to grab this data filtering tool, and I want to grab this um, this prioritization tool or this calendar tool. So they aren't necessarily developing these individual applications. Um, at once, but they're pulling together lots of different components to be able to build a, a cohesive solution. And then when we think about roles that are definitely more technical adjacent that benefit from understanding artificial intelligence, we have a few that I wanted to mention. So we have like our business stakeholder. So this is like our business boss type of person who um, is the strategic leader for projects. They make investments in technology and they really align and set the direction for business goals that can be impacted with artificial intelligence. We have user researchers. This is like kind of my home uh, space where we basically kind of uh, rely on psychology and sociology and technology to connect people to problems and, and solutions that we can develop with technology. And you can do that from both the technical side and the non-technical side. We, we also have data steward, stewards, and these are kind of like the, the data nerds and also kind of like the lawyers, the people that give us access to data that protect data of users. And they understand the um, aware, the, they're aware, I'm sorry, of the possibilities with data. And they also keep up with laws and regulations. So it's a really cool role where you're not necessarily doing programming and coding all the time, but you're actually managing data and keeping up with legislation and, and privacy expectations of, of customers and that sort of thing. And then you also have biz, business analysts. And these are kind of, um, these are like the on the ground money makers. These are the people that understand that, you know, back to that hotel example maybe it's if we always make sure that lauren has that synthetic pillow she's more likely to book with us every single time than if she has to ask for it so these are the people that are really highly connected to the business problems the performance the data and the kinds of solutions that will make a business that'll make a difference for the business so i'm going to wrap up with um Introducing you guys to the Open P Tech. So we have Open P Tech at IBM. There is a ton of great resources. You can go get a badge on artificial intelligence right now. It's free. It takes about six hours. You'll build a chat bot, um, which is really super cool. And you can get a badge that you can add to your LinkedIn or even like your resume, college applications, that sort of thing. There's lots of material there, whether you want to focus on artificial intelligence or blockchain or data science or just professional skills. There's tons of resources there for you. So that is all I have for you guys for the presentation. And I'm happy to take any questions that you have. OK, I was muted. That was so amazing. Um, I don't know if you can see um, can the comment, see yeah. but um, a mom said her son said said he would create something better than Cortana, which is a personal productivity assistant for Microsoft. Yes, it sounds like a, a digital planner um, type thing. Um, so. Um, what I really loved about your presentation is you really went into the different type of roles, particularly in like, you know, that last slide, the different type of roles that people, um, youth can explore, even if they're not necessarily STEM, um, skilled, like my, like myself, I'm, I'm a writer, you know, mm -hmm. and. Um, so the user research, which you said is, um, you know, your home base, that's really fabulous. Um, you know, given that, would you encourage youth to focus on the math and the sciences, um, if they're I interested in getting into artificial intelligence, or do you think that, you know, if, is someone who loves English, but he or she also has a passion for technology 
in science as well. Like, would you say that they definitely can use that skill that they have to still be in the STEM industry? Absolutely. So I've worked with folks. Um, there's someone on my team who, um, she was a, I want to say she was a psychology major in undergrad or maybe, I don't remember if it was psychology or political science. So very not quite like hardcore STEM-ish. Like she did some statistics because you have to take one class. And she really decided she wanted to get into data science. And now she's a data scientist on our team. She went to grad school, did her master's in that. One thing that's super important is that artificial intelligence and data science is going to be very key. So just like when, um, so I was, I graduated high school in 2002, right? In 2002, like the thing that everyone had to be able to do when you graduated high school was use Excel, right? Everyone had to be able to use Excel, Word, and PowerPoint. And that was like the pervasive skill. Well, now it's data science. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to be able to sit there and code everything. I, like I said in the beginning, I don't really get to do that much actual artificial intelligence, but I have a lot of, you know, content knowledge that enables me to be able to work in this education space in artificial intelligence. Um, you know, even though like I literally, I think the last time I took like a computer science class was probably sophomore year of college and it wasn't great. <laughs> So there's lots of different pathways, but everyone yeah. needs to become data science literate and understand how artificial intelligence impacts us. Because if you you're on this call, you're on this, um, you know, this stream, there is artificial intelligence impacting your your day to day life. So everyone should know something about it. There's space for all of us. Um, an another mom said, my son wants to know if Discord bots count as AI. So do you mean Discord bots like uh, like social media bots? My guess is probably yes, because that's probably, that's definitely something everyone's talking a lot about. Um, but yes, that's artificial intelligence. Um, and something that's really you know, interesting, I didn't get into it in this presentation too much, but we have lots of different ways in, um, in especially in deep learning, like um, I don't know if you guys have heard of deep fakes, basically where you can create videos that are not real um, from data that's available. So like, you know, that's something to think about, like, you know, this call is gonna be on YouTube. Someone could say, oh, I wanna make a deep fake of Lauren talking about artificial intelligence. There's the thing is, is that a lot of these technologies are not all that great. And we can tell that something's not right, usually. So, you know, if we're talking about the discord bots, like that you might find on social media and that sort of thing, they, you can almost always tell that something's not right, because it's like, you know, maybe the grammar is not correct, or the interaction might be super slow. But there, there are lots of hints that can give you an idea that this is like not human, but they are getting better. So it's something that we're also, um, you know, as a field really looking at is how can we, um, one, prevent these kinds of, you know, bad case or bad use artificial intelligence from being available and out there in the world, but also how can, you know, individuals be able to tell the difference between what's real and what's not. And I love, I love how you bring in the social justice aspect of it. Um, because something that occurred to me while you were speaking during your presentation is that we have to remember that it's people who are creating the technology right now. It's people who are feeding the information. So even um, as far as, you know, when we talk about diversity, and you know, having all type, having youth from all types of backgrounds, who um, should be uh, should pursue um, careers in artificial intelligence if there's interest there. Like that's so important, right? Absolutely. I mean, like I mentioned, a lot of this, you know, the idea of user research is not always doesn't always happen. Like, there's not always like a focus group where people come in you know, share their information. Sometimes it's just like a tech team sits in the corner and says, oh, I wanna make a thing. So an example of what happens, you know, when um, when not just the people that are developing the technology don't think about, you know, all kinds of folks and people that, you know, other than themselves. A, a simple example is like um, when the, the hands-free, uh, like, uh, 
sink, the hands-free activated sinks started coming out, a lot of times those of us who are darker couldn't get the sink to turn on because there was never testing done on people that were our color. So, you know, it's not just about necessarily, you know, it, it is about like one, finding these opportunities about things that you're passionate about. There's tons of applications of artificial intelligence and there are tons that haven't been discovered because we just didn't discover them yet because maybe the people who are creating them don't understand the problem. Mm-hmm. Or don't know the people that that experience the problem. So that's something that's super important. Um, you know, that book that I mentioned, A People's Guide to AI, is very like based on a liberative idea that we can use artificial intelligence for for the benefit of our community. And that's something I'm super passionate and care deeply about. That's amazing. And um, even like the activity that you shared, where um, you know those of us who are um tuning into the live stream can create their own app like you guys definitely after this um continue to brainstorm and think about the type of solutions that you want to see um be created and then pursue creating them right (laughs) exactly you can literally go learn a bunch about chatbots and make a chatbot on ibm open ptech which is super cool like you know, and and the cool thing there is that you don't even really have to be able to code. So, you know, there's a lot of ways that you can create technologies that don't require a lot of coding skills as well. It's great to have it, but it's okay if you don't too. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, so I don't think we have any more questions. Um, I guess we can go ahead and wrap up um, with uh, any other last words that you want to share. Ooh, I don't think I was ready for that, but I can come up with something. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, one, I'm super excited to be here. Thank you for having me. Um, you know, there are tons of opportunities to, you know, impact technology, and um, I really just hope that you will all you know, one, feel free to reach out on LinkedIn, say, hey, I attended the Semlink um, Team Cafe, you know, definitely connect with me on LinkedIn or Twitter or anything like that. Um, But definitely, there's lots of ways to create the things that haven't yet been created. And Mm -hmm. it's a matter of, you know, creativity and bringing that know-how together. And, you know, data science artificial intelligence is like the wave of the future so you know get in it for for sure because there's a lot of opportunities to do really cool things in the world yes love that like i said like the activity that you included was the perfect um you know entry point for those of us who are tuning in and um their kids have an interest in you know, technology and artificial intelligence, just like Dr. Quigley said, like go ahead and start brainstorming and start creating. Mm-hmm. All righty, well, thank you so much. Um, as we wrap up, I do wanna mention uh, that we have a survey that is going to um, go out and we would really appreciate it if you guys will fill out the survey. Um, We also have, Simlink has their STEM in the City this Saturday. Um, So registration closes, pre-registration closes on Friday. That is also going to be on artificial intelligence and weather prediction. So, um, you know, if your youth enjoyed or your teen enjoyed this awesome workshop um, cafe, then definitely register for the workshop on Saturday. And I just want to thank everyone for joining us for the cafe. Thank you so much, Dr. Thomas Quigley, for making time. I learned so much and I don't even really deal with artificial intelligence, but just seeing how it impacts like everything. Like I do remember not um, setting up Bitsby because one time I accidentally set it up on a previous Android and it told me I needed to go to bed. And I was like, oh no, like my phone can't tell me to go to bed. Oh, no more of that. Hey, really- everywhere. <laughs> so, 
So I really appreciate you taking time. Um, thank you everyone for tuning in. And those of you who had people who maybe missed it, it'll be on our YouTube channel. And so we will send, make sure that they have subscribed to our YouTube channel and you can see Dr. Quigley's activity in full, talking full and be sure if you're interested in AI to go ahead and you know do some of the activities that she suggested that you can do on your own that have a little more time. But thank you again and have a great night, everyone. Thanks. Bye, everybody. <laughs>